How are you doing today, sir? I'm good, baby. How are you? <laughs> I called you baby. I'm like, <laughs> um, I'm doing very well. That was not what I expected to be called, but I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, seriously, congrats on this movie. Uh, you and Jessica are fantastic. Um, and uh, I have a lot of questions about that, but because I have so much time with you, there's a bunch of things we're going to talk about. Hopefully, uh, you enjoy the questions okay. as I prepped. Uh, so I want to start with what TV series would you love to guest star on? Ooh, Search Party. What movie or movies uh, have you seen the most? The Goonies. Um, Teen Wolf. Um, Back to the Future. Ghostbusters 1 and 2. Indiana Jones the Temple of Doom. I mean, Joe versus the Volcano. Ooh, an, a little unorthodox choice. Clean Slate. Got it. Okay. Do you, do you know Clean Slate? Steve? I don't think, I, I actually, you know, I've seen a lot of movies and I don't know if I know Clean Slate. It's a little known Dana Carvey. Um, wait, he wait played, I do know this. like the original Memento, but it's a comedy. Right. I do, I, I do actually know this movie. He has amnesia and he wakes up every morning and he's forgotten everything he's learned from the case from the, from the day before. He's like a detective with amnesia. I haven't seen it in forever. I think I only saw it once, but I know, I know the film. Um, uh, jumping into something else, um, when you're filming a movie, how can you leave the character you're playing on set or does a piece of it always come home with you every night during the shoot? I can choose. I decide... Sometimes it's useful to keep it with me. And other times it's very, it's important to, to leave it. For instance, when I was doing the social network, we were shooting um, the scene where I come to Palo Alto and I'm covered in drenched in rain and Justin's character, Sean Parker answers the door. And I'm very surprised to see him. I'm not all that happy to see him. And, you know, I come in and me and Jesse have our kind of tiff. We got halfway through that, that scene on a Friday and we hadn't done my coverage yet. And I had the weekend um, to stew and I just decided to stay in it. That may not have been a good decision because I went to a couple of like, it was like the Golden Globes that weekend or something. So I went to like some Golden Globe, pre Golden Globe parties or something. And I think I got into an altercation with a couple of people that I shouldn't have got into an altercation with. <laughs> and I'm not gonna name names, but it's uh, for a private story sometime I'll tell you. Um, the social network is what I call a masterpiece. When you think back on the making of that film and working with Fincher, uh, besides this story, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Jesse, laptop smash, that day, that long goddamn day, and, and Fincher being such a good dad that day. He was like the perfect sports dad. He was like... In, instilling me with keep doing it and you can keep doing it. Believe that you can keep doing it. I know I'm going to ask you to do this a lot and your voice is going to be tired and your heart's going to be tired and your body's going to be exhausted. And I know you're going to hate me and that's okay because we are going to get it absolutely perfect. And then at the end, instead of saying we're moving on, I'm, I was sat on the floor after take 35, 40 of, of that, of my close up of that scene, which you can imagine would have been a lot of, uh, screaming and kind of agony and I'm sat on the floor just kind of wiped exhausted thinking we're probably going to go again another 10 times and he just kind of walks up to me up that corridor from this monitor and he kind of puts his hand out to me and pulls me up and and shakes my hand and he says moving on and that was that so that so that was a beautiful moment I felt very very um kind of oh, gratified like leaving it all in the field that was a beautiful day I loved it in the years since the film, have you talked to Ed Eduardo? <laughs> no, no. I, I wonder if I ever will. I would, I'm, I, I'm open. I'm very, very open for that conversation. I would love to have a hang. Uh, one of the things about Fincher in all of his movies is that he gets amazing performances out of everyone. And every director that I've ever spoken with has a different way of working on set. Fincher obviously has a very unique way of, work, of working on set. What is his secret? Because it's not just about the takes. It's about him being an amazing director. So what, what is it that gets these amazing performances out of everyone? I think a, a lot of it is 
getting the act that, that what, one of the things I understand about why he does that amount of takes is that he's getting, he's getting the actor so that he forgets the act. So that the actor, he or she forgets they're being filmed. Um, so that that's a part of the, the kind of the magic of the performances in, in each of his films. I think he's looking for that moment where you forget you're there, you forget what's happening and there's a purity and a vulnerability and an openness. And the audience responds to that in a deeply unconscious way. Um, suddenly you're, there's no acting, there's no performing, it's just pure. And I think that's a part of what he's looking for. And also he's very precise, he can, he can see it. And he, and I think the way he said this before, I don't think I'm mis misquoting him, it's like being a catcher in, 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 a, in a baseball game. He doesn't know why it works, but when when the pitch hits the glove just so, he can feel it. And he's like, okay, we got it, moving on. So he just has an instinctive trust. And you know, the the, the best directors I've ever worked with have that. Mel Mel Gibson's that way. Scorsese's that way. Um, you know, a bunch of other directors I've worked with are that way. Mike Nichols. You know, it's 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 an instinctive. Oh, that was it. Got it done. There's not a. It's it's a body like gut kind of intuition. What was cooler for you, uh, being on an episode of Doctor Who or hosting SNL? I'm not, I don't wanna compare things, um, but I will say that just for me personally, I'm much, mm, I wasn't a big Doctor Who fan, to be honest. I loved doing it, I loved working with all the people on it, but I have to say like my history is much more an SNL fan. My father was a big SNL fan. And so I, I felt much more like that had lived in my imagination. You've done a lot of stage work and I can't imagine if you're ner like the nervousness that might go on before you step on stage. Did that help you when you're getting ready to come out on stage on SNL or are you still shitting bricks when you're about to walk out from behind the door to 1130 at night on a Saturday? Oh no, it's every time. No, no, yeah, it's every time, every time, no matter what it is, SNL or theater or a film set, like it doesn't like, there's always that kind of like you're in the, you're like a, a, a horse in the, in the starting blocks and you're just like, why isn't the cage opening? And am I going to die when the cage opens? Like, no, I, every time before I go on stage or do any kind of performance, there is a threshold to cross for me internally, which is, am I going to die if I go out there? I think I might die. Hmm. Do I risk it? Cause like, I haven't died yet, but maybe the, t today's the day that I die. But SNL was, in, was sp specifically intense for, for, for all the reasons you can imagine. But like, yeah, you're in this back, you're in this box at the back. There's not space back there. You get brought into this box and then those doors open. And, um, and I remember, I think I was just dancing and I was just like kind of thrashing and just like making sure that I wasn't getting st like stiff and tight in my body. And I was just kind of like, I let the energy just kind of, kind of leave me, like go through me and used it as best I could. But yeah, it was, I, I've never watched SNL, the SNL that I did. I never intend to, because it was just the most pure experience. And I don't want it to be ruined <laughs> by watching my work in it. Cause it wasn't, it was just like the experience is the thing. And being actually like the great thing is like being a part of the, um, the, the, the crew and the company and supporting them in, in their brilliance. Like, I think that's like, how I, if, if I ever do it again, that, that's the intention. It's like, you know, I, I just want to be here to help you guys shine. That's like kind of like the awesome part of it. You have managed to land such incredible roles through your already amazing career. Is there a role though that you went after that you didn't get that still stings? No, actually, no. I mean, there's, there's stuff that, it's kind of the opposite that there's, there's stuff that I was offered that I said no to. And again, but I don't regret it. I don't, there's nothing I regret. It was absolutely right. And, uh, no, I, I really have this weird kind of wacky belief that everything is perfect. Everything happens for, for, for a reason. So no, I, I don't, I don't, um, no, actually, no, no. You got to work with Philip Seymour Hoffman and Mike Nichols on Broadway. And I am curious, and it's been it's been something on my mind since you worked with them. How much did you actually pay to be in the production to work with them? Because it that's insane. Yeah. It it was it was the best, one of the greatest times of my life, creatively, spiritually, life-wise. I had just finished shooting the first Spider-Man film and um 
I, I, I needed, I needed it. I actually needed it for my, my soul. Like theater is my home. It always will be my home. My first kind of creative spiritual home, I suppose. And to do, to, but, but, but then to do an Arthur, to do Arthur Miller and to do that particular play. And then, you know, you, 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 you put Phil as Willie Loman and then Mike directing. I mean, what, 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 you know, it does, it doesn't bear, it, there's no way of being able to comprehend the, the kind of the, the perfection, perfection and beauty of that experience. Like it's, it, it, I'm so grateful for it. What do you think might surprise people to learn about being part of a big Broadway production like that? Your dressing rooms are pretty shitty for the most part. Um, that, that, that may be. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything I could say that would be surprising. It, it's, it's, it's just a, just a great, it's just so soulful. It just feels so right for me. Um, there's also a nice thing that happens in Broadway where everyone who's doing a show at the same time gets to know each other. There's a community that you actually feel a part of, which is a rare thing in what we do. And everyone is, you know, supportive of each other's shows. And it's, so it's that, that was a surprising thing for me because you don't get that as much in London because it's all a bit more spread out. The theatres are a bit more spread out. Whereas in Broadway, you're all neighbours on a nightly basis and you're seeing each other in restaurants late at night afterwards and or bars and asking how, how tonight's show went and who was in and, and uh, what you fucked up and what you got right. And yeah, there's a real kind of community feeling. Uh, you did amazing work with Angels in America. And I know that every night it had to take, really take a toll on you at any point before you, at any point during the run uh, in London or on Broadway, we were like, I, I can't do this anymore. This is really killing me. Yeah. A few times. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch of times. Um, yeah. I, and I know it's only a play and you know, it's not real life, but you, your body doesn't know that. Cause if you're, if you're doing it you know, for the way, the way that I work is, you know, you're, you're attempting to live it as much as you possibly can living under those circumstances and those imagined circumstances that the character is going through. So your body is creating, you know, chemicals and adrenaline and, um, pain and uh, woundedness and joy and you know you're in love and you're losing your lover and you're dying and you're visiting heaven so like you're losing your mind like especially in that play the character prior that I played goes through he just he goes through the whole human experience in eight hours of um, of life death and then life again and like being faced with a choice between life and death and choosing to live you know I mean it doesn't get more profound than that or more agonizing and suffering than that um, so, so yeah, there were nights where I was like, fuck this, why am I doing this to myself? And those were the nights that were the best performances probably because there was something else that had to come in. Cause I did, I knew that I couldn't do it with sheer will and drive and force. I knew I needed to, to lean back on something else, something, some unseen, call it God, call it my own higher power, call it the universe, call it the theater gods. Like I needed help to get through. And the, and it's weird. The more you let go, the more, the, the freer you are and the more the thing just happens. So, I mean, those were the, those nights were the most special ones because you felt like you were being kind of carried on some kind of wind in, 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 and yeah, it's beautiful. You obviously made two Spider-Man movies with Mark Webb. I don't think anyone can prepare you for being in films of that scope and scale and what they mean to a studio and the marketing and everything. Do you miss being in those sort of films? Because, or are you sort of like, I'm glad I experienced it and those are kind of scary? A lot, I mean, I feel a lot of ways about it. Like, I'm really glad I did it. Like there's no, not one part of me that, that regrets it at all. Like I feel so grateful for all the friendships and relationships I built and, and the experience, like the, like how, I, I got to have that experience of being a part of the, that kind of behemoth kind of thing. Um, and playing a character that has meant the world to me since I was three, as we all know. And so there was nothing, and, and I learned so much about myself, about how I like to work, how, how I don't like to work, about what storytelling means to me, about what it doesn't mean to me. I, I learned a lot about my own relationship to, um, materialism, commercialization, commodification, selling t-shirts and mugs and happy meals. Um, that, that, that stuff's tricky for me. I'm not, I'm not crazy about 
that aspect of our culture, to be honest, the, 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 the highly consumerist kind of aspects of our culture that I think does a lot of damage um, because it, it breeds a meaninglessness it, for me. I think it's that there's a there's a redirect that I want to be a part of, which is back towards things that are more um, eternal and dependable because the things that we are being kind of taught to depend upon are just um, so um, undependable. Um, so for me, and I think COVID has done this for a lot of people is it's, it's brought people back to actually, what do I love and who am I and where do I want to live? Do I want to live by a river? Do I want to live by a lake? Do I want to live in the woods? And, and how do I get rid of, you know, this being um, the, the thing that, that defines who I am, how I'm perceived, how I perceive myself and my value in the world. Um, you know, I'm being a bit glib, but, but, but also I, I for, so for me, that was a really interesting dy d dynamic and dilemma for me. So it's so on the second press tour we created me and my, um, my friend, we, my, my publicist at the time, we created this with Sony, we created this splinter press tour so that every city we'd go to, we would go and visit, a kind of a small local philanthropic organization and bring all of the energy that w and attention that we had from this character and this story and you know the predominantly wanting to sell cinema tickets but actually there's there was a way of redirecting it towards you know those more kind of underdog peter parker organizations around the world so that that was the the kind of remedy for me um yeah, so you know, it's it's a big learning experience for sure. Uh, I, I am curious though. Did you ever talk to Drew about that Sinister Six movie? Was that like how close did that actually get to being made with you? I don't know how close it got, but I definitely had a, a few meetings, and it was really exciting. <laughs> I've got to say, because Drew, I love Drew so much, and I love Cabin in the Woods, and I, you know, and and, and the and the other stuff that he's that he's made. And we, we just got on like a house on fire and I loved his vision. He's so unique and odd and like kind of off kilter and, you know, uh, you know, not unconventional in his creative choices. So yeah, that was definitely a fun couple of months, but you know, life, life. No, I, I get it. I'm a big fan of Drew. And actually that was the thing that really disappointed me when that film didn't happen, just because he's such a comic book fan. And I just was so excited about seeing his take on yeah. these characters and, you know. It would have been cool. Maybe one day he'll, he'll get to do it. Yeah, but it would have been cool. Um, and by the way, I, I agree with you the, with the material things, except if you look behind me, you know, <laughs> I, I think, I, think I, I often think about Fincher's uh, Fight Club and the, the line of the things you own end up owning you. Yep. You know, it's, it's just, anyway, that's a whole separate thing. Um, jumping into why I actually get to talk to you today. Um, which I, I, I'm sure you were like, we're never getting there. Um, <laughs> what is it like actually stepping on set or in rehearsals with Jessica when you see the level of commitment she is doing for this role and how, how passionate she feels about playing this character? Yeah, it's awesome. And you expect nothing less, you know, it's, you know, that's who she is as an actor. And I, um, I admire it a great deal. I value, I value that kind of commitment. And, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I knew that would be the case. Um, and it was great because it means that you can just show up in the scene and you can really just be present with your fellow actor. And you know that, that it's going to be truthful and you know that it's going to be um, uh, alive and, and honest. So I, and, and yeah, and you know, it's, it's, she's a remarkable, remarkable artist that I got to, to witness firsthand and play with. So I'm very grateful. I always lo love learning about, you know, things about the making of a movie that you might not have heard. What do you think might surprise people uh, to learn about the making of this film or the research you did? Just, you know, something you could share. Yeah. We would go to church every Sunday, me and Jess. We would go to um, the Heritage USA, um, their old uh, stomping ground. Me and Jessica would go get a coffee every every Sunday morning, and we would go. and And it's a different evangelical church now there, but we would go and, and join service and just kind of hang out, commune, kind of cringe at things that didn't make sense to us, and kind of got, get quite moved about things that did, and uh, kind of talk to the community there. And we got toured around, and we we would do that as a ritual together every Sunday. Um, and yeah, it was very very beautiful and surprising. I didn't expect to be doing that with Jess, but it was a really gorgeous thing that we got to explore together. Um, 
you know, um, yeah, that, that, that I think was, was definitely unexpected. I would imagine that you research and prepare a lot for every role that you're going to do. But for something like this, where you're playing, uh, I guess I'm just curious, what is the level of, you know, you know, you're going to film in say September, when are you actually really digging in and focusing like laser focusing on, I'm getting ready for this project? It depends, you know, with, with silence, I took a year with Hacksaw Ridge. It was probably about three months. With this, I would say probably about two and a half to three months. Um, with Lin Manuel's movie Tick Tick Boom, I had to learn how to sing. I had to learn how to play piano, and I had to embody Jonathan Larson. So that and and it happened just so happened that I had a year to to do it while doing other things. So that was a year and a half. So it was that was kind of on the that was boiling for a year and a half. And then, um, and then the real just firm focus was probably about four months for that. Um, anyway, so it's, it's different every time and, and each thing requires a different amount of different type of study, a different type of preparation. Like the thing I'm doing now, this is a, a mini series of under the banner of heaven up here in Calgary with Dustin Lance black. And, you know, I, I got to go to Salt Lake city recently on my way out here and do some hang out with some Mormons and some ex Mormons and some bishops and uh some gay mormons and some uh you know fallen mormons and some cop mormons it was you know so that stuff and the same with 99 homes i got to go to florida and do a week research of people who were affected by the housing crisis and yeah that, that stuff is really i just love it uh one of the things that i don't think uh people realize is what jim and tammy faye did i mean they, they literally built a media empire which is and back in the 70s yeah. or early 80s this is really hard to do you yeah. know what what do, i mean can you sort of talk about what they accomplished before obviously their downfall i know it's insane like you know jim jim was a builder like he built a theme park he built as you say a media empire he he built housing for single mothers who had been abused he had built housing for disabled kids he they had ministries all over the world um it's remarkable what he did um it, it's insane like i have no idea how one and of course you know if, i think as soon as you start building in that way you're gonna you have to get into some corrupt stuff to keep it going and also for him his justification was is that god wants this god wants me to create places for Christians. He wants me to convert as many people as possible. He wants me to make Christianity fun. He wants me to show that actual material prosperity is what God wants. He just happened to misread the word prosperity in the Bible for material, commercial, financial prosperity and comfort. Whereas etymologically from the original Greek, he discovered while he was in jail, spiritual prosperity is a very, very different thing to economic prosperity. And I think he started to understand that when he was doing more study after he went to prison. The thing that I think a lot of people forget is what Tammy Faye, she was on the side of supporting people with HIV and AIDS and supporting gay people and supporting marginalized people when it was not, um, you know, it's a little easier now than it was back then. Can you sort of talk about that she was really um, just a really good person. Yeah, you know, I, and, and again, you know, Je Jessica will have a much better, more in-depth answer to this, but from my, what I perceive is that Tammy was a proper Christian, like in the sense of, you know, give me, give me your poor, your weak, your hungry, you know, it's, it's those real true Jesus Christ Christian values of the people who feel ostracized and exiled and mistreated, um, that those are the people who she felt this tremendous kinship with and connection with. And um, it just so happened that, of course, you know, the and, and, and she was very camp. She was camp. She was fabulous and kind of she was a drag queen in a way, you know, like that's one way of of uh, perceiving who she was with with her makeup and with her outfits and with her performative kind of stance and and the joy and the fun and like self-effacing humor. And I don't know, she was, she was kind of a remarkable anomaly in that world and in the world generally. After you wrap what you're filming now with Dustin, do you know what you're going to do? No, not, not right now. Not right now. I have, um, um, no, it's because uh, we're, we're shooting until December. So it's a little bit of a ways off. 
Oh, wow. Okay. I, yeah. It's all, it's a mini series, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to jump actually real quick and talk about tick, tick, boom, which is a project I cannot wait to see. Um, I'm over, I'm just, I'm very excited. Um, I still get sad when I think about Jonathan and, and dying so young and it still bums me out. Um, what did it mean to you to basically play him? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, to the best of my ability, it was, yeah, really profound. Like I, I, I want to talk more in depth with you at some point about it because I, I really do feel whew, very, um, uh, it's, I'm really connected to the project in a way that is, is deeper than usual. And I, I feel very, uh, great deal of responsibility and joy in, in, in that I got to attempt to, to, to honor him and the sacredness of his life and the sacredness of what he was trying to make his life about. Um, and him as an artist, him as a friend, him as a, a boyfriend, him as a son and him as a revolutionary, you know, like he was, he was um, not afraid of ruffling feathers and upsetting people. He was someone that want that saw uh, that saw how sick the world was and how toxic the world was. And he actually really wanted to change it, you know, whether it was about the environment or about, again, you know, commodification and materialism, um, a kind of uh, a cruelty that he was witnessing or a kind of, again, like, and it was all in the backdrop of his friends um, getting sick and in a lot of cases dying of HIV and AIDS very young. Um, so that he had this profound awareness of, um, the kind of um, the missing the mark of life that the culture was doing, that the, that the people in charge, politicians and leaders were doing, especially when it came to, you know, not protecting the sanctity of the lives of his friends. Even though people know about him, there's just so much they don't know. Yeah. Uh, I am curious what I, I know Lynn is obviously a huge fan of his, uh, you know, Jonathan's work. What was it like those first few days on set when you realize the significance of what you are trying to bring to the screen? And did you feel that sort of pressure or were you sort of just so excited to be there? I think I felt, I started to feel what I imagined Jonathan felt in his short and fireworks energy of, of a life. Cause he was always at an 11 because I think somewhere he knew he didn't have long, like tick, tick, boom, you know, it's his heart. And we, you know, for those of us who do know, he, he, he died of, of um, Marfan syndrome at 35 on the eve of the first preview of Rent off Broadway. And it was, it was a, a heart condition. He had a heart attack. And so Tick, Tick, Boom is a, a pr prophetic. He, he knew there was, a, there was a thing of like, I know I don't have a lot of time, time to get this to get these songs out, to get my song sung as much as possible. Like none of us ever will, will sing our song fully in this life. We will all die before with an, un, with a, with an unfinished song. We hope we, we leave people behind who will keep that song going. So for me, it was like, I think I woke up every morning as the character of, yeah, pressure, but it was like the tick, tick, boom pressure of how do I, I've got to, how do I honor him to his hilt? How do I, how do I even attempt to reach towards who he was as a person in all of his dimension and in all of his lust and joy for life and all of his kind of cosmic prophetic awareness of what the future, like a kind of this, this dystopian future that he kind of predicted. And also like going back to the things that are of real meaning that he was trying to wake us up to, he was trying to wake up a generation to, um, to a, to a life of much more meaning and of creativity and art and community and, you know, all of the ethos of um, Bohemia, all of the ethos of um, rent, like that's what he was trying to do. Wake us up to, to life and the celebration of life and the sanctity of life. So yeah, I woke up every morning after just a few hours sleep because he wouldn't let me sleep with um, that kind of yearning and need to fulfill his legacy and to keep his song being sung. That was a, uh, the greatest gift. Cannot wait to talk to you more in depth once I have seen the movie. Uh, I have to wrap here and I'm just going to say thank you so much for giving me so much time. And uh, I wish you nothing but the best, man. You too, dude. Nice to see you.